top of the hour, so welcome everyone to our uh, webinar, which is uh, an Excel masterclass on designing a better forecasting spreadsheet. So I think it's going to be absolutely fascinating. I'd like to introduce you our speakers. Uh, start off by introducing to you everyone who's just joined us to uh, Joe Sparks. Joe uh, is uh, a, an experienced um, Excel designer in the um, uh, Excel exams. I can't remember the name. She scored 100% uh, in the Excel designs and likes to call herself the dashboard diva. Uh, uh, also known as the PowerPoint Princess or the Cinderella of spreadsheets, um, <laughs> uh, and uh, you 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 really love working with uh, working with Excel, and you're probably best known for uh, to our readers for having designed our uh, Erlang calculator. That's right. Hi there, and uh, yes, the Erlang calculator and the forecasting spreadsheet um, are my fault, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> hopefully you're finding them useful. And, uh, but yes, I do love Excel, and uh, I've used it um, since the late 80s when uh, they first brought it out, so from, right from when I was a baby. So I like making it do what, <laughs> what I tell it to do. And uh, Joe's also a, a hired hand, so if anyone's got any difficulties with their uh, spreadsheet, she is available for, for hire to help, help them out. <laughs> uh, also d uh, delighted to uh, welcome Dave Appleby. Dave has worked in resource planning for, for uh, a great number of Years, both in the in the UK and uh, more recently out in Malta, uh, is probably best known for our to our readers as a uh, avid moderator on our forum and on our LinkedIn LinkedIn group. And uh, Dave, I'm glad you, I think I'm glad you use the word avid and not rabid. <laughs> and uh, Dave, I believe your 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 favourite uh, topic, if you were to mastermind, is to uh, yeah. explain why Excel. Uh, Forecast two agents who only only have one call per uh, period. Oh yes, yeah, done that one one or two times now. So very good. And uh, you've based out, you've been out in Malta for uh, for a number of years. Been out in Malta for four years now. Um, very different call center environment here. It's um, probably looking like the UK was maybe about ten years ago. There's a lot of innovation coming in and a lot of new new ideas coming in. Um, it's a very, very interesting place to be from from a, a contact centre forecasting point of view. Excellent. And delighted to also introduce John Casey from the forum, which was pro previously known as the uh, Professional Planning Forum. John, welcome to the to the webinar. Hey, John. So delighted to be here. And you've been a real driving force behind uh, getting the whole contact centre industry more uh, professional and setting up the degree course in contact centre planning and, and management, management. Which yes. at BSC level. I think there may be a master's coming in in the uh, in the pipeline in the in Indeed, the not too future. Yeah, and it's great to see some of the students actually here. It feels like only Tuesday since I've seen them, but on, see them again on the call is great. And it's something we just want to set up to allow some proper recognition for the experience and the expertise within this industry. Excellent. So um, we're gonna, we've got some uh, interesting presentations as ever, doing lots of your uh, lots of your questions and uh, questions and answers. There will be a replay available later on today. That's at callcenterhelper.com forward slash recorded uh, webinars. Uh, there is a, uh, a bottle of champagne or a box of chocolates for the best tip. Uh, and uh, if you use hashtag for a tip, uh, there's also a hashtag question if you have a question you'd like to ask of the ask of the panelists. Um, we are in the chat room. That's at callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat going along, on alongside the, uh, uh, the webinar here. And if you want to get hold of a copy of the webinar slides, once you're logged in, you can download the webinar slides on this uh, link here. We are going to be going through a number of Excel functions as well as a number of forecasting methods. So it's probably be quite useful to get hold of those uh, slides through through there. Um, uh, I'm just going to share with you a couple of, uh, couple of thoughts as a, a bit of a plug. Uh, we do have the, um, if you're not familiar, uh, we do have a, an Excel uh, Erlang calculator, um, which was designed by Joe Sparks, and uh, that's uh, on the link at the bottom of the page. Uh, and um, actually, the, that whole winter applies to it to the uh, our forecast. And we do have an online version uh, of of that as well. And uh, this is the uh, we recently introduced, I think, about nine months ago, a monthly forecasting sheet. This combines the Holt Winters uh, technique 
uh, with uh, the solver function in uh, in Excel. We'll be going into a little bit of detail on those uh, as uh, Joe and uh, Dave do their presentations on the two pieces. Um, but one just little bit of insight I wanted to share with everybody is that um, we're probably all familiar that uh, calls are distributed, uh, you know, some are long, some are short, and uh, if you should only work on them, you, you all have heard they follow the Poisson distribution. So you may, be, uh, may think that the Poisson distribution looks like this, a sort of slightly lopsided uh, uh, distribution where, say, perhaps this is a three-minute average and then you have so many calls on this side and so many calls on that side. Um, but that's not actually how calls are, are distributed in, in real life. And when you actually look to it, you find that actually there's no cluster of calls around the average, and that if you actually looked at the distribution of calls, and notice this uh, was provided by my, my, my friend um, uh, Loder van der Sander from Call Care Consulting, um, he looked at the distribution of calls and found that it uh, they had an average of five minutes, um, but effectively there's actually very few calls clustered around. What you have is lots of lots of very short calls. Uh, you have a, quite a number of very uh, very long calls, and then you sort of have an average distribution. It's actually much more sharper if you didn't have it on a log scale, and you do get some sort of abnormal sort of one in ten thousand of calls that perhaps could be over two hours, even though the average is uh, average is five minutes. So there is a, a very different type of um, type of distribution. So uh, it's one thing that when you look at uh, outputs of things like Erlang calculators or or outputs of, of different systems, and you think, why is it uh, we're getting some of these strange uh, strange results? That is one of the reasons for it. That the distribution isn't quite uh, what you expect, and that's actually one of the reasons why uh, an Erlang calculator will sometimes return uh, more agents than you would uh, would expect. That's just one of the uh, just one of the, the factors uh, factors behind it. Well, um, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to uh, ask a poll question of the audience, and uh, that poll question I'd like to uh, ask is uh, how do you forecast? Do you forecast currently manually? Do you forecast purely with Excel? Do you use Excel with input from uh, workforce management uh, software? Do you do it with Excel with input from other systems, or do you purely use workforce management or another system? So if I just launch the uh, poll there, if you'd just like to vote on which uh, one you think is most likely uh, most likely to come up. Uh, John, any, any take on which one you think people are likely to be using? I think it's going to be a lot towards the top of that list and very unlikely to be the used WFM. Well, let's have a look at the uh, let's have a look at uh, the uh, answers that we've got here. So uh, what we've got is six percent of people do it manually, forty percent only use Excel, um, thirty-two percent uh, use Excel with input from a workforce management system, which is actually quite a common common method. 12% uh, use Excel with input from other systems, and 12% just purely use uh, use workforce management. Dave, uh, what's your favourite method of, uh, of forecasting? Um, combination, really. Um, I tend to use Excel as the the base calculator. Um, data comes in from the WFM, looking at um, looking at a lot of the variables, but then uh, you've got data from other systems as well. And it's it's a case of, of incorporating what's going to be the most use to you. Um, there's no point in incorporating data or trying to incorporate data if it's not going to m materially affect your, your outcome, um, I think. Indeed. Well, now is a, a good chance to uh, jump across to uh, Joe Sparks, uh, who uh, has uh, been working in Excel for a long time and is going to share some of uh, her favorite uh, uh, advanced formulas uh, which you may find uh, find useful in in generating a, a forecast. Thanks, John T. Uh, well, since John T asked me to do this, I've been racking my brains thinking, what can I tell you in the next 10 or 15 minutes or so that's going to change your life the next time you open Excel? 
Um, so it's going to be quite a challenge, and there's probably thousands of tips that I could share with you. So um, I went to Dilbert for some help on uh, writing my presentation because he actually it's got it down to three things. There's only three things wrong with your spreadsheet, and that's your data, your format, and your formulas. <laughs> so with that in mind, I'm going to show you some tips centered around setting up your data in the first place, how to format it, and as many useful shortcuts, formulas, and tools as I can, as I can fit in. So I hope you'll find a useful nugget or two amongst them, um, and at least where to find things if you haven't seen them before. Um, so diving in with data, um, then my, then my biggest tip really would be that with very few exceptions, you should always keep your data separate from any calculations you're doing in a separate worksheet. Uh, and Because one, one of the biggest causes of spreadsheet breakdown is the fact that um, someone's named a range just with letters and numbers, and they've got that referenced in a formula, and then they'll add something to their data, and the formula will completely break down. So if you keep your data separate and give the whole range a name, then it's possible to make changes, and your, all your formulas will stay intact. Um, Always make sure that every column of your data has a header because most of the special the forecasting tools or pivot tables rely on lists of data having headers, so get them in there in the first place. And, uh, and one of the biggest tips I can give you is to make use of tables um, because you can add rows underneath um, your data you've got now and new columns to the side and your table will automatically expand to include your new information. And if you've got any uh, current set of data, you can convert it to a table by clicking on it and pressing Control T. And you'll be asked where your data is, it'll try and guess, and whether it's got headers or not. And once you click OK, your formatting will change. And uh, now your data's got a properly defined structure. And you can give it a name in the design, and you can use that name in your formulas and pivot tables. So whenever you use that name, um, you, it will reference the data that you've got, and you can change your data to your heart's content, it, your name will stay the same and all your formulas won't break down. Um, so one thing what you're going to need for forecasting is properly formatted dates. And sometimes entries in your spreadsheets can look like dates, but they're not. They're text, so if you've, especially if you've imported them in from somewhere. And you can quickly come unstuck if you try and analyze anything if your dates are not really dates. And, what, and a good place, you're probably already using the text import wizard, perhaps to bring in external files. But in step three of that wizard, I don't know if you've noticed, because I didn't notice it for a long time, was that actually you can specify what format any column of your data is. And one, uh, one of them is a date. And you can tell it that even before you import any data. And I guess it's not just dates. It's, it's times as well is, is one of the things where I often see confusion between one minute and 30 seconds, uh, one minute 30 seconds or 90 seconds, depending on. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And uh, times can take a little bit of working with in Excel. And uh, yeah, it's worth spending a bit of time finding out exactly how they're structured and how you can. And that uh, one thing, of course, is that um, Excel uses hours as a portion of a day. So you can, if you've got a, because people subtract times and end up with a digital number that looks like a load of rubbish. Um, and so you've got to multiply it by 24 to um, to actually get the hours then that you're looking for. So there's a lot of there's a lot of tri tics, trips, tricks, and tips that you need to get to um, to grips with to um, to deal with times. Um, something else that can help you um, as well is flash fill. And um, you might have noticed in the past, if you've got some data already in your spreadsheet that is a date, and I've got some here that are, are dates written backwards, but um, Excel wouldn't recognize those as a date. So if you started typing what they are, um, you should see, after you've done a two or three, that um, some gray, grayed out text will appear underneath that, and Excel tries to guess what you want to achieve. So if you see that gray text, then you can just press enter and the whole of the rest of the column will autocomplete. And that can be quite magic sometimes in terms of saving time. Um, if the grayed out text, if Excel can't guess what you're doing, then if you type two or three and you press control E, it will have a good go and uh, you'll get a whole list of data. So um, you can use that for some other things that you might otherwise try and use formulas for, uh, like splitting names out of email addresses. Because if you start writing the first names out in a list, it will soon recognize that anything you've put before a dot or anything before, that's before the act is what you're doing, and you'll be able to completely fill in the rest of the column. And we've had a comment from Neil who says, when I work with time, I always use the HMMSS format with the square brackets around the H which allows time to count above 24 hours. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, that's a nice good tip. Um, so if you're trying to put your data in chronological order, though, the 
absolute best way to do it without having to write any formulas is to use a pivot table because it's um, a good way to combine and control um, any data that you've got. Um, in our table example before, we'd got to the number of visitors to call centre helper by date. So using a pivot table, we could quickly show the visitors, say, by quarter, quite literally in seconds, without, without writing a formula at all. And because we've got all of our data in a table, we don't have to go and try and find it. You can just type the, its name in the table range box, and uh, Excel knows exactly where it is. So once you click OK, then you get a blank template. This is going to be, by the way, the fastest introduction to pivot tables in history, because it could do with a webinar all by itself. But um, I'm just going to go quickly over the features if you haven't used it and seen it before. Um, so you've got this blank template appear, and you'll be able to see the fields from your data are on the right-hand side, and they're labelled with your column headers, which is why it's, it won't work if your data does not have headers in every column. It will just say, I can't do that. Um, so say we wanted to see the summer visitors per quarter, what we need to do is click on the month field in the top right hand side and drag it down to the rows area on the bottom bottom right there. And because our data was properly formatted as dates, um, Excel knows that and it will automatically group them into years, quarters and months. So straight away where your template was before, the blank, we're now seeing years and you can see little pluses next to them. And uh, if you expand those out, they will expand first into quarters and um, then into months below that. So what we want to see is our, is our data in those periods. So next what we're going to do is um, drag visitors to the values area. So, and then Excel will have a guess at what you're trying to do with that information. Here it's already decided that we want to add them up. So it's chosen some of visitors. And uh, you can see here then that the... Um, if you haven't expanded, then you can see the number of visitors per year. And as you expand each section out, you will get the number of visitors in that period. And that's all without having written any formulas at all. So it is a really powerful tool. Um, if Excel, sometimes you might find that it does um, a count rather than sum, uh, where it just counts the number of entries you've got in your data. So if that's the case, then the way you change it is um, in the values area on the right-hand side here, where it says sum of visitors, there's a little drop-down arrow there, which will give you some more options about what you want Excel to do with your data. So you change that the value field settings there, and you get this box pop-up that says what do you want me to do with it. So you can choose to count them up or average or show the maximum in that time. So you've got lots and lots of options, and you can even you can start um, adding your own calculations in there, and uh, which will update as your data updates. And I think often pivot table I like to think of as the one thing that sorts an intermediate from an advanced uh, advanced user. And it's the, the one if, often if you're going for a job interview and someone wants to test you on your Excel knowledge, asking if you can do a pivot, pivot table is uh, quite a good way of uh, sorting out uh, levels of Excel skills. Oh, well, that's a good tip then, because actually once you've, once you've used it a few times, it'll become second nature and you, it'll be, it's the first place of choice rather than trying to work out a formula is, uh, is to go in here straight away. Okay, so once you've got everything in chronological order, then you can start to chart it. And a chart is, charting your history and your forecast is really important so you can visualise what's happening. Because uh, the chart's always more revealing than just a table of numbers and your eye is actually a pretty good gauge of the quality of the forecast despite what the numbers show you, your eye is, is one of the best things. And there's just a little tip here, um, is, which is really useful anywhere in Excel, is to use Control-1 um, for formatting any element you're in. You can be in a cell, whatever you've got selected at this current moment, whether it's a cell or whether it's a chart axis, if you press Control-1, then the right formatting menu will come up. And, um, and that's much easier than trying to move around all the menus and doing it. And I use that all the time. Um, so if your data is time-based, then a useful chart to use is the line chart. Uh, if you're forecasting on a base other than time, then an XY scatter plot might be more appropriate because you can control both the X and Y values and add any number of series and error bars. So starting with a basic forecast, and you can't really tell that this data is completely made up. Um, it's nice and linear. Um, so I just thought I'd use it as an example. Um, so to perhaps behind the relationship between unit cost of a product and how many sales we had. And perhaps we're going to use this information to forecast the sales would be in the future if we chose a certain price. So I've got an XY scatter plot here with, um, with unit cost against sales. 
So in order to get an idea of the form of the relationship, you can right click on this chart and select trend line. And then you'll get a, another little menu option appear on the right hand side. And you can select the relationship that might seem to best describe your data. So real data is going to be a lot more complex and you might want to try exponential may even be a good one to start with. But for now we're going with the linear because that's easy. And uh, we can tell it to display the equation on the chart. And um, so now you can just plug in the values for any chosen cost and predict the number you're going to sell in the future. Um, it is worth noting though that um, Excel will always be able to find a relationship between two variables even if that is really weak in actual fact. Uh, it will give you a line, it will find one for you and it will display the equation. So again using your eye is a, is a good judge of that. Uh, you can also use a proper function for testing that which is a correlation which is how robust um, two variables are related. And um, all you need to do with that is use the function coral and um, you, you could tell it where your two ranges are that you're trying to get a correlation between. So in, in our instance that's columns A and columns B. So it will give you a number and it has a possible value range from between minus one and plus one. And the closer it is to either one of those extremes, the stronger the relationship between your two variables. So if you've got a correlation of zero, that means it doesn't think there's any relationship at all. So in this example, the cost, the correlation is coming out at 0.969, which is, which is very high. And uh, it might mean that you could safely predict values outside your current data set with some, with some degree of, of sense that it is going to it's going to be real but um, do be aware though that correlation is not causation just because two things appear to correlate highly doesn't actually mean they're related in any way at all and you should always be on the lookout for a, a third variable that might be what you really should be investigating and if you find these things as amusing as I do there's a, a whole website of spurious correlations but this is one of my favorites that um, the number of people who died being tangled in their bed sheets is very highly correlated to how much cheese they ate and um, so it is very important to, um, to, to check that the variables that you're comparing are, do really affect one another. And there's another one here about the number of um, Nobel Prize winners being related to the amount of chocolate they eat. So, um, and we, we, these are obvious nonsense, but it, it may not be quite so easy to spot the same in your own forecasts. Um, so now we get on to a set of tools in Excel that can help you with some more complicated analysis, which you may already be using, but that's the analysis tool pack. And this is an add-in in Excel, so you have to choose whether it's installed or not. Um, there's 19 different tools built in, and it can do a lot of the hard work for you. And because it's all pre-coded, you don't need to worry about whether you're getting the formulas right or not, because it's all done. So once it is installed, you'll see it on the data ribbon in, a, in an analyze group and uh, you can see there there's data analysis and solve appear together in the analyze group and uh, just as a note as well if you're lucky enough or recent enough to have Excel 2016 um, they've added in some new um, forecasting features and uh, business intelligence tools and they now have forecast sheet as um, is one of the tools that you can use and it actually very quickly takes your data and demonstrates what happened depending on what, what kind of analysis you choose it will give you a quick demonstration in another sheet in a visual now, way of what that looks like. Now Joe, if I'm right in understanding, the analysis tool pack doesn't necessarily come in, it, it's sort of bundled in the software standard, but it's not installed on the ribbon. Is that the same that's, with the solver as well? That's correct, yeah, they're both add-ins, so you'd need to go to um, your, your file menu and options and actually look for Excel add-ins. And, uh, and if you have downloaded the um, forecasting spreadsheet, there is actually an instruction, there's some instructions there about how to make sure that add-ins are installed and where to find them. Um, so, so there's all these options, but um, it's quite difficult to just jam your numbers through a tool and take the result at face value without understanding what's actually going on. So the problem might be to decide what forecast might even be credible unless you know what they, what they all mean. So how do you know what to choose? Uh, and the ones I usually start with are these three here. Uh, moving averages may be a best choice if the only information you've got is your history, um, because by averaging your results from period to period, you can get a better idea of the longer term trend that's influencing your results. Um, exponential smoothing also uses your past history, but you get to take account of how bad your previous forecast was, because you can take the error in your last forecast and hopefully improve the next one. 
and then regression is the one that we've just been talking about with the uh, against the chart and uh, you'll be asked to give Excel two ranges and uh, you're using one variable to predict another. However, with these tools, it's not quite so visual because once you click OK now, you get a completely new worksheet created, which is which can look quite scary. Nowhere near as visual as a chart, but if you like numbers and um, and you understand all the confidence limits and t statistics, then they're all in they're all done for you straight away. And the most important result in this one particular one we've been doing now is the coefficient section at the bottom of column B there, and that's showing the same values we got when we put the trend line function straight on the chart. Uh, and another useful figure, which you can also get on your trend line charts, is R-square, which gives you some more information about how good your estimate is. That's in B5 there. And if that's close to 1, then your estimate's quite good. And if it's close to 0, then you should probably try a different kind of a fitting altogether. So I'd suggest playing with the different tools in the tool pack just to see the effect they have on, on your numbers and see which ones you find you might find useful. There's also some quite good tutorials on YouTube as well that uh, help to uh, uh, take you through some of those some of those details. That's right. Yeah. So then the biggie on um, that on the analyze that's available in the add-ins is Solver, and um, because that you ca it enables a particular cell to achieve a particular goal, which might be to minimize it, maximize it, or be some target value, and you can tell what you want. Tell Excel what you want it to do, uh, and this cell has got to be maximized, minimized, or a target value. So it does that by adjusting a number of other cells according to a set of criteria which you define, and then it uses one of um, a couple of algorithms that it has available to test different scenarios until that optimal solution is reached. So it can help you where there's no easy relationship to be seen in your data. And we use it in the forecasting helper tool, which has a combination of averaging and smoothing called triple exponential smoothing, which I think um, Holt Wilters we're going to talk about in a bit. Um, it's a huge topic to go into in a short time. But on this slide, you can see that in cell J1, I've got a variance value, which is currently shown as 0.04. And that figure was achieved by comparing some forecast values to, to some actual values once we got them. So what we want to do is minimize that, that error to change some other values that we've got. So I've got some um, constraints for the other cells I've got highlighted in pink, and I wanted those to stay between 0 and 1 in value. And once I click Solve, I want Excel to test as many values as possible of all those three variables that will make the cell in J1 as little as possible. So that will affect all the other calculations going on in my spreadsheet, and I want that result to be as small as possible. So it could take thousands of attempts and calculations and some time to achieve that. But Solver will carry on trying until it thinks that the result can't be improved or until you stop it. And one of the questions that we often get about the forecasting helper tool is that, uh, oh, I get a different answer every time I run it. Um, well, that's because um, the different it might use a different starting point every time. Um, it, it'll choose different points and then and try and uh, make the error as small as possible. But that's why it's, it starts somewhere different every time, and the answer can be slightly different every time you run it. But because it can do so much in such a short time and test so many values, it's one of the most powerful options that Excel has got for rapidly testing different scenarios. Wonderful. Well, we're, we've got. Uh, I think Joe's got some other uh, functions in the in the slides there. Uh, we're going to jump across to the uh, jump across to the the uh, chat room. And uh, where Rachel has been uh, collating everyone's uh, everyone's uh, questions. And uh, Rachel, what uh, questions have you got for our panel so far? Yeah, can you see my screen? We can indeed. Fab. Okay, so um, we had a few questions sent in before, um, and Alicia's asked, "What is the current global industry average shrinkage applied to FTE requirements?" Um, John, I believe you had a, an answer for this one. Yes, Rachel, I had a quick look on Dimension Data who do a global benchmarking report each year. And what they're currently saying, I'm just going to bring my screen up here, and I have two slides of interest. Now, this survey can be broken down by country, by industry sector, etc. But if I leave it global, it's showing agent sickness at 10%. Well, you wanted to show your screen there, John. Oh, did I not press the button? Oh, I can see it. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, 
the technology always there with us. But what it's showing is about 10% sickness for agents as a global average, which is 25 odd days a year if you want to change it into a different currency. But it also shows that once people are at work, what else and the time that they're at work. And if we just, I suppose, look at the bottom four here, because handling contacts and being available is not shrinkage. You've got an additional 25% of their time at work where, on average, they're offline doing other work-based activities like one-to-ones, coaching sessions, team meetings, etc. So I hope that goes some way to answering it. So sickness 10% and on the day 25. Yeah, and if anyone else has got any other figures of what they use for shrinkage, perhaps if they could, uh, uh, if they could put that into the chat room, would be good. Rachel, you got another question? Yeah, rather a long question from Scott. Um, hopefully, I'll try and summarise it a bit. Um, he was just asking, is there a method of using a typical week of interval volume to apply something at the weekly level that would work? Any other method? Um, don't know whether I've I've said enough. Uh, Joe or Dave, have you got any suggestions? In fact, actually, I, I was going to suggest John with his um, with his <laughs> team on the, the uh, on, on the um, on the degree on the the, the UOM uh, University of Ulster degree course for this one because this is this is this is non-normal forecasting. And um, from my side, the answer is yes, you can. But you have to be prepared that it is a it is a best guess, and it is not something you can rely on on the way that you can rely on Erlang to do you a, a forecast for an hour or a half hour or a quarter hour. You can use it to give you a broad strokes approach, but there are better ways of doing it. Yeah, and I agree, Dave. I mean, you can use Erlang for any time period you want, 15 minutes up to an entire day or a week. But well, it's only going to give you high-level numbers in the second stage is how you break those staff down afterwards. And I think just for you know one thing on the question that comes out to me is the difference between forecasting the volume and forecasting the head count. And I think the key is the volume and the head count is a static equation once you've got the volume calculated. Brilliant. Um, we had a question sent in by Ralph. Um, he uh, he stumped me with this question. Um, so I think um, John, you were also John and Dave were having a discussion before we started regarding this question um, about the formula and everything. I think, I think Dave I think and I were some... having. Oops, sorry, John. Sorry, John. Yeah, the summary of the question is basically uh, the co the contact volume depends how old a, a customer is. So if a customer has just joined you, they have a higher propensity to call as a new life customer than a, a more experienced customer. So it's some way of producing a formula that, if you like, could, could plan that volume of how many new customers have I got, how many old customers have I got, and how does that transfer into a, a call volume? Across to you, John. Yeah, I think we're having a lively debate on this. We could probably fill an entire webinar with the answer, but I think what we were saying is once you get into this type of a model, A, identifying the trend of customers. It's a little bit like postal in the UK where you know you can send out a thousand letters today and they will arrive on different days. That you almost have to just, the complexity comes as natural in the, for, in the spreadsheet and can't be avoided. Probably leans itself to some kind of regression modeling as well if you're looking for the trend. But once you know it, I think it is long equations like we see. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, just to add to what John said, um, unfortunately Ralph said uh, the, tab the data table is huge and we were talking when we were talking about this before, unfortunately if you are forecasting out to the three months in advance for your, for your customer, uh, for when you, your customers are going to call in, it is going, to, it is going to be a large data table whether you like it or not. Um, and I don't know whether Joe's got any tips for handling large data sets that she'd like to throw in very, very quickly. Yeah, it's an easy, well, it's an easy way of summing up the context per day. I mean, it might be a candidate for trying to put in a pivot table to start with, uh, and then you can at least filter it by your customer, and then which might reduce the, the size of what you're looking at. Um, I don't know if that might help a little bit. 
<laughs> Fair. Thank you. Um, so Michael said, has anyone tried to do forecasting using Chinese, the Chinese calendar? I'm doing forecasting for a region that uses Chinese calendar and I'm having challenges specifically with their holidays since it falls on different date year over year, normally two weeks off from the previous year. Um, Dave, what would you have to say? Um, I mean, this is, this, is, um, this is a standard seasonality question. It's just um, the problem is what the, your only problem is you, you've got a data set that um, if, if you take your previous year's data set as being static, what you'll then have to do is apply a change to that, transform your data, um, so it does an offset to where you want it. Now, normally two weeks off from the previous year, I don't know if the holidays form a regular pattern that holiday X is a certain amount of days after holiday Y or anything like that. Um, but what you can do is, and it's something that um, we were talking about, uh, we'll be talking about a little bit later, I was talk I'm going to be talking about outliers and how to deal with them. Um, and the thing is, this is, this is where you, transposed, uh, you, you, use trans you transpose data and where you use a new, where, where you insert new data in place of, of what you've got in your, in, in your, existing, um, in your existing base data. So I think what you're going to have to do is you're literally going to have to look at, I have a holiday on the 1st of January this year, it's going to fall on the 14th of January next year. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to take the data from the 1st of January, plug it into the 14th, but then you've got the question, what do you do with the 1st of January, where you've just taken the data out of? Now, do you just use a standard Monday or whatever day it is? Um, do you just use, um, do you actually smooth it out as a progression through the week? Um, this is this is all stuff that I'll I'll be looking at a little bit later um, as as to how you patch your data in, but I think the only choice you've got is to literally transpose your data across. Um, again, I don't know whether John would like to any add anything to that. No, I think what you're saying, Dave, you know, is in line. It's really it's an impact. You have to say that this holiday increases or decreases by 10 or 20 percent based on the year or the two years before, and then just apply that moving forward and take those rough percentages as a starting point. And sometimes you don't necessarily have the, the year before. I remember, Dave, a little while ago, trying, you were pulling your hair out, trying to figure out how you would forecast your very first uh, World Cup in a in a company that yeah. is going to get a huge spike, and so it, it's it's almost you you look at other uh, you know trends and it, this is what actually happened. You've got to try and work out what the underlying trend was should that not have happened, and then that gives you some sort of weighting, and then you can if that was say for one sporting event, you could then you know apply that bigger or larger to a, to another event. That was what we did. We ended, up doing, we ended up taking the data from the Confederations Cup, um, looking at the uplift we were expecting for the World Cup because they were both in Brazil, and then looking at the times that the contacts came in throughout the night, uh, because Brazil's obviously uh, a long way behind in terms of time zones. Great. I think we've got um, a couple more. So we've got an opinion. So David said, uh, I use Excel plus common sense. <laughs> I think that was on the back of the, uh, the poll. Can I actually add something in on that? Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's something people forget. You can look at an output from a WFM system, uh, but unless you can do it unless you can do it manually in the first place, you don't know whether you're getting nonsense out. Um, you have to be able to to produce a manual forecast and then back check it against a WFM to make sure that you are okay, back check it occasionally to make sure that it is giving you, you you're not just following what the computer says. <laughs> yeah, and um, we've got two tips. Um, Dennis said pivot table saves time to compute for the seasonal indices. And Connor says, I use ribbon shortcuts to access pivot tables and other frequently used tasks, which is more efficient use of my time. So thanks for those. Um, so, back to you, Jonty. Customizing the uh, customizing the ribbon can uh, can work very well from uh, uh, can work very well for that uh, 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 for, from that uh, perspective. Uh, so we're, I'm just going to ask a, a question, a, a poll question of the uh, audience, and uh, that is what forecast method uh, do you use for forecasting your volumes? Do you do it manually? Do you match uh, trends by eye or match a trend by eye? 
Um, uh, it's like a typo on that one, I'm afraid. Uh, it uses a homegrown algorithm. Do you use something like Holt Winters, which is triplet exponential smoothing, or do you use something like a Rima? If you're not familiar with those uh, terms, don't worry, because Dave's going to be uh, uh, going through those in a bit. So let's have a look at uh, how everyone uh, chooses to forecast. This is absolutely fascinating. Uh, what we've got, 49% do it manually, um, which is quite uh, quite fascinating. I, I quite like to do a manual forecast. It's always a good way. My favorite is a, a bendy ruler. It's one of the best things for, uh, for, for curve fitting. 15% um, uh, matching trends by eye, 31% homegrown algorithm, 2% Holt Winters, and 3% uh, Arima. John, I'm, I'm, I'm very surprised by those uh, res results. Are you? Yes and no, John. I actually wonder after Dave does his few slides, if we were to do this again, if the bottom two would actually increase. Because I have a funny feeling that some of our homegrown algorithms and our manual methods are not far from Holt Winters and Arima. But yes, it's just... The, the nature of it is we may not be associating those terms at the moment. So it, so it would be interesting if you have got a homegrown algorithm, uh, if you'd uh, like to express what it is in the, uh, uh, it would be great. If you'd be prepared to share that, send me in a spreadsheet. I would uh, love to be able to uh, love to be able to see that. So we're going to uh, pass the baton now across to uh, Dave Appleby, and um, uh, Dave will be if you could take us through. Uh, your thoughts on uh, how to uh, uh, increase um, forecast uh, accuracy through spreadsheets. Yep. Can you see my screen? We can indeed, yeah. You can indeed. Right. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to run through some basic bits and try and translate um, types of forecasting. Now, we have the standard Erlang C, which we will use. We're getting Colt Winters and Arima that have both been mentioned so far. Now, as, as John says, um, Holt Winters and Arima may be ones that you're using, you just don't know you are. Um, um, and it, it may be working that, um, it may be working that um, you know, your, your models are actually more complex than the standard Erlang C. Um, what we've got, effectively, um, what do they actually mean? Um, they look scary and they sound scary, but they're... Um, they're actually not as bad as not as bad as all that. Um, standard Erlang C, which has been around years and still works. Um, please don't think that because there are other methods, the old methods are obsolete. Um, a lot of WFM tools and things like that still look at um, uh, and forecasting tools still look at um, still look at the Erlang model as the baseline for for how they forecast. Um, it looks at historical data. And provides a forecast on, based on existing trends. Now, the one thing we do need to say to that is what it does is it looks at the data you give it. So if you're not including a previous year's data, if you're only using the previous six weeks to forecast the next four weeks, you're only going to be looking at your recent trends. You do need to weight data into it. Uh, even if you're only giving the previous year maybe a 10% weighting because you've changed, um, you've changed something, um, this, this, this all works as this all works as 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 standard as a standard method, and um, and really is the baseline for how how we should we should be starting off. Now, Holt Winters is an expansion on the forecasting method, and what it does is it allows you to add seasonality components to a basic model. It allows you to smooth out and allow for seasonality. Um, it allows for the introduction of your. Uh, I've used the word pseudo-random because it, it's ones that um, it, it, it's ones that, that that do happen, but um, and roughly at the same point each year, and also to allow for annual events. Now, the pseudo-random events would be in the UK. I should have actually thought about it when I was asked the, the question about the um, the Chinese calendar, because this works with Easter in the UK and with bank holidays in the UK. Um, which is something where you do need to, to apply apply some common sense to, you, to your data. But with Holt Winters... Also, also sorry, there is triple, triple exponential smoothing, isn't it, the, uh, the Holt Winters, because it looks with the seasonality, the level and the trend. Yes. Um, but the, the one thing to, to bear in mind is um, 
the one thing to bear in mind is it, it, it's only smoothing your data. It is not necessarily, and it, it's showing you the trends. It's showing you the hidden hidden points within your data and the trends within your data. Um, it really is very good, but you do have to have your previous data for it. It's not one that you can say we're using six weeks historical data and we'll apply a whole winters to it because it won't allow for it. It needs to be looking at a larger data set to be able to, to, to smooth out. Properly. And typically that tends to be three years, isn't it? You've got your first year, then you've got your second year to do a sort of a, a baseline to see what the trend is. And you almost need a third year to know if one of the, th the two other years was wrong. Um, it's wrong, yeah. Um, but that's 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 the same. That that's the whole thing with sample sizes. You have to you have to use a sensible sample size. I mean, if you know, you could say fifty fifty percent of people like chocolate, but if you've only sampled four people, um, you don't have a representative sample. Um, Holt Winters and Erlang C, you do need. Well, in fact, all forecasting models, you do need to have a decent sample size. Um, I know John's come across yeah. people. Um, that have only worked with four weeks data, to four, only working with four weeks data to to predict the next week, mm. um, which doesn't now, allow for it. has been getting a lot of a lot of press recently, Dave, because that's uh, the the Met Office have started using a, a in their their forecasts. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. That makes a lot of sense, though. That makes an awful lot of sense. Um, I know that. Um, it's, it, it sounds scary. It adds additional smoothing to a forecasting model by looking at the existing data and the moving average as well, and, and adding on a layer of adding on a layer of smoothing to, to bring a bring more meaning to the data. Now, the one set of people who are using this, um, along with they're using a combination of Holt Winters and Arima, are Tesco's. And what they're doing is, sorry, I, I should have I should have actually said a large supermarket chain. I don't know if I'm allowed to give names out. Mm -hmm. uh, what they're doing is they are actually using a combination of these models, and also, um, as John has mentioned, the Met Office, they are also pulling in the long-range weather forecasts to actually uh, as an actual seasonal mo seasonality model to allow for forecasting things like when are people going to be having barbecues, so when do they need to get more salad in, mm. and things I like that. I spoke to one uh, chocolate manufacturer and in their contact centre, they found that I think it was every degree over 20 degrees, the chocolate would start to melt in the, in the lorry, so they could actually predict the number of calls that were likely to come into the, uh, come into the contact centre. Yeah, it's 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 amazing. Um, I can remember from a couple of years ago, one of the the forums, um, one of the forums prize winners, the awards winners, was actually using weather as part of their um, as part of their forecasting methodology. I can't remember who it was. Um, it was probably Thames Valley Police, Dave, because I have a student looking at that at the dissertation level. She's actually on yeah. the call today. And one thing that she has found is that crime levels go up and down with certain temperatures, so the volume of calls go up and down. Indeed. So, Dave, you got any advice on outliers? Any advice on? How to remove outliers from your data. Yeah, that's no problem. We'll move on to this one next. Um, the first thing, the first thing to say is outliers happen. Now, John T gave a, a that slide at the beginning with the red, the red data points, um, where you've got the the outliers kicking, uh, you've got the outliers sticking at the end. Um, the trick is to know when and what to remove. Um, now, John Casey, John was on the call today, quite sensibly says we need to analyse outliers. You need to re you need to analyse the outliers you're going to remove because you don't know what is an outlier and what is actually business as usual and what is potentially becoming a business as usual pattern so it's it's fine to take it's fine to remove outliers but you know you need to know why they happened what they happened and are they happening on a regular basis um, deciles and octiles um, which is basically dividing your data into 10 or dividing your data into 8 and then looking at the the top and the bottom are the most useful depending on the spread of your data and how how, how widely spread it is um, just one thing is if you are removing outliers don't forget to remove the short ones as well as the top end long ones uh, if you're looking at call length or anything like that everyone seems to think that it's fine to tr everyone seems to remember to trim out the long calls 
but you need to trim out your short calls as well because they are they're, they're affecting it at the other end as well. And then we had something that, that, that was a subject of much debate um, to what to add back in. Um, you obviously can't just if you take a if you take a 10 minute call, you've got an average of a two minute call and you take a 20 minute call out, you obviously can't just put a zero in there. Um, you need to use the, what, the question is what are you going to use? Uh, are you going to use the ninth decile figure? Are you going to use an average of the previous, um, are you going to use a mean of the previous week's data? Now Colin Whelan uh, of the forum recommends actually using a second or third standard deviation from the point. Um, to give you a middle of the range, middle of the road um, fill-in fill -in point. Now it'd be very, very interesting to actually ask the chat room what people what people use to to fill in outliers, because I've got a feeling we're going to get a lot of different answers to this one. Yeah, so if you'd uh, just like to put into the chat room, uh, how do you uh, in your call centre remove outliers uh, from your uh, from your data? And then. Uh, the last thing I'd like to do, John T, is just go through um, call arrival patterns. Now, this is something I've discovered and something that I, I know I've kicked out to people. And what's happened is um, some people have strongly disagreed with me. Some people have strongly agreed with me. Uh, but I'm going to ask one question when I've, um, when I've, when I've pulled this slide up. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up a clock. So there's our clock. Um, quarter of an hour intervals, and I'm just going to fill some numbers into it. Now this data came from a UK utility company from, from six months of the data at the end of 2011. And what they were finding um, in the mornings was they were literally getting 40% of their contacts in the first quarter of an hour of the day, uh, the, the interval and 30% of the contacts just after the half hour. Now what I'd like, again, I'd like to, very, very interesting to ask, ask, ask out to our audience here. How many times have you actually looked at your watch and said, I'll just leave it till just after the hour before I give them a call, or I'll leave it till just after the half hour before I give them a call? Um, this is one of those things that's human nature in action, um, and something that can be, it's worth looking at your data to see what's happening within your quarter of an hour intervals and see not only where you're staffing, um, but uh, where are you allowing people to take breaks or training or things like that. So the so, inference, Dave, from this is that uh, if you can, a 15 minute, uh, 15 minute uh, forecast period uh, would be better than an hourly or, or, uh, or, or 30 minutes. Now this depends, um, as, as the conversation we had earlier with John, um, this depends on your call length. Um, on a shorter, up to 10 minute call length, two thirds of the interval, um, 15 minute is fine, up to a 10 minute call. Uh, up to a 15, 20 minute call, you want to be looking at a half hour, and then if it's longer than that, you do need to be looking at, at, at hour long intervals for forecasting. Because you've got to allow for when people queue, you've got to allow for when 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 does your switch actually take the call? Does it does it log the time on when the, the call arrives? Does it log the time on when the call was answered, or does it log it on when the call was terminated? So you need to know how your background system works before you can actually forecast on it. Fabulous, and I've seen that pattern in quite a number of uh, forecasts I look like, look have looked at a big cluster around the uh, hour and the uh, and the half hour uh, mark. I think it also ties in with people when they finish work when TV shows end uh, and things such as that. But you're going to jump across to uh, Rachel now. And uh, Rachel... Um, John T, uh, I, I think actually we're going to go straight to John. Um, otherwise, he has to leave at two. I'm going to miss we'll, out on hearing his presentation. We'll jump across to John. John, do you want to share three of your shots? Indeed. Can you see the screen? Yeah. We can indeed. Brilliant. And what I just wanted to do, John, too, is maybe just to bring a couple of little tips out of one of the courses on the degree program. Uh, and we talked about it at the beginning of the call, and really, as I said, it's the first program which will, has been set up to professionally recognise, I suppose, people in operations, resource planning, quality, etc. I'm not going to dwell on that uh, at this point, except to say people can give me a touch. One big thing that I always like to bring out is we've got to look at the intervals, not the day. 
it's so easy to say I predicted 4,400 calls and I give or take got 4,400 calls and my accuracy was 0.5%. I think that's a false celebration that we do. Mm -hmm. If we can say I got it spot on, I'm a great forecaster. But given that we probably gave this to the schedulers and we look at the numbers up above, 15% below, 20% over, whatever it might be, it's not really a great forecast. And I think it's one of the misnomers is we focus a lot. I was an outsourcer. We focused on getting it right for the month, for the week, sometimes for the day, but not for the interval. I think what we all have to look at is let's break it down. And one way to do that and it's something I'm very passionate about when I'm teaching classes is at a forecasting level, it's equally bad to over forecast and under forecast. So make all your numbers positive, get the differences. And now when you add them up, the difference is no longer 20. It shows you were out in this complete made up example by over 500 calls for the day. And now when we break that down as a percentage, we suddenly get a 13% inaccuracy. Completely different story. Different. As they say, you know, there's number statistics and damn lies, or there's, uh, you know, targets drive behaviors, and you can make it look whichever way you want. I think that 13% is a truer indication in our industry looking at the interval levels. The other one, and I think it's something, I think you do have a question to show later, but the magic, what target should I have? And 5% probably comes up 50, 60, 70% of the time. And it's there for no other reason than it's a nice round number in my opinion. And your accuracy, you'll see in maybe something on the next slide, but the first thing is we talked about Poisson, we've talked about standard deviation, and the reality is you need to have about 1,600 calls before your the noise and the randomness is plus or minus two and a half or five percent. So if you have a queue of 100, 200, 300 calls, mm. over time you will not reliably hit that five percent market or target. It's just it's just not possible. So you do need a good number of calls before the five percent comes in. On targets, I'm not going to do numbers. I actually think this is the truest thing of all. We should always be doing continuous improvement. It's what we're after. It shows you're understanding your data and you're able to move forward. And the other one is understand scale. Because at the end of the day, can you afford the inaccuracy? Because using 5%, if you have 100 calls a day, it's plus or minus five calls. Well, you'd expect your agents to cope with that. If it's 1,000 or 5,000 calls a day, suddenly you're into plus or minus 50, plus or minus 250 calls. I've just used some average UK salaries and costs. And at 5,000 calls a day, 5% 5 accuracy could be a quarter of a million pounds, $400,000 per year. It's not such a great target when we look at it that way. So I do think that's something we have to challenge. And one final slide is don't ignore volatility. I think we focus a lot on the accuracy. And this slide at the beginning really was the classic, let's get the accuracy right. Get it right over the day. But I think we have to look at the very fact that sometimes you could be 20% under, 20% over. And that's a huge, huge challenge on your schedulers. And by not understanding where the volatility is and knowing where you're likely to be over or under by extremes puts challenge on scheduling and also puts challenge on repeat calls coming back into your business. So that's my slides, John, if you want to grab the screen back. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much for John. I think there's some uh, some great uh, great thoughts on there. Certainly in terms of the uh, uh, the forecast accuracy is certainly uh, very important. Uh, Rachel, we've got time for a few uh, a few tips in from the uh, in from the floor. Yeah, um, Michael said uh, use calculated fields in pivot tables to save adding extra columns to your data. Uh, Laura. Nice 
has said, uh, I always find it is useful to show forecasts in a ge in a sorry in a graphical format, as not everyone can look at a table and understand it easily. Um, Nick said, create a holiday factors tab that correlates volumes on particular dates versus normal seasonal volumes and recognizes this for the next date in the series and gives uplift or reduction based on previous volumes of that set only. Michael said, I use weak num function in Excel to incorporate previous year's data with the recent data to determine WOM and DOW distribution. So this is where it converts a date into, say, week 52, so you can look at how, how it correlates with the same period last year, which is quite a nice one. Yeah, and to finish, Ralph said, select the whole columns where your data is in your source file and not only, in, not only the cells, which I think is great. Wonderful. That's a bit of a rush through on the questions. We have got quite a large number of questions coming through, and I will circulate those questions to our experts, and we'll see if we can get those added onto the uh, uh, added onto the uh, uh, onto the website if we uh, if we can. Um, I wonder if you could just, in one or two words, put into the chat room what did you like best about uh, the webinar today? Just a reminder that uh, replay in the slides will be available callcenterhelper.com forward slash recorded webinars. That will be available probably in about uh, within the uh, within the hour uh, if you want to share that. Uh, we've got, uh, we're going to be looking at how to really empower your agents in two weeks time. So just like to say thank you to our speakers. Joe, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Jonty. Uh, Dave, thanks for joining in from uh, Malta. Thank you. I'll get back to the sunshine now. And uh, John, thank you for, for joining me. I know it's been a very week, a busy week for you with your annual conference, so thank you for joining us today. Not a problem. It's been a pleasure, John. Thank you. And if you could just complete the survey uh, as you leave the webinar, that's great. And uh, thank you all for, for joining us. And uh, thank you and goodbye to all.